The next part of this lecture deals with subatomic particles. The history of how subatomic particles were discovered is actually very fascinating, and unfortunately we don't have enough time to go over it in class. There are some additional details in your book. Here is sort of the synopsis of the development of Rutherford's nuclear theory. This came from something called the gold foil experiment, where he was directing helium 2 plus particles, which are beta particles, at gold foil. His expectation was that he would determine the structure of the atom in the gold foil by determining the deflection of the beta particles. What he discovered is that most of the particles went straight through the gold foil. So that indicates that a lot of the space occupied by the atom is actually empty. However, there were major deflections, which indicate that there was a centralized area of positive charge in the atom, and also some minor deflections, which indicate that there was perhaps an area of negative charge. This gave scientists information that the nucleus consists of a very densely centralized, positively charged area, and that most of the area of the atom is empty. So this experiment took place back in 1911, and it led to the nuclear model of the atom. Here you see that there are two particles on the central area of the atom. These are called neutrons and protons, and it was thought that electrons orbited the outside of the atom. So this is consistent with a positive central core and a lot of empty space in the atom. Through subsequent experiments, scientists were able to understand quite a bit about subatomic particles. We're going to stop at electrons, protons, and neutrons in this class. There are actually smaller subatomic particles called quarks, but an understanding of electron, protons, and neutrons will be sufficient for you to understand a lot of the chemistry associated with the atom. So first off, the protons and the neutrons, which are in the center of the atom, are the materials that were dense and had mass associated with them. Each of them has one atomic mass unit. Electrons, on the other hand, have almost no mass. As far as the charge on the atom, though, the two species that are important are the proton and the electron. The electron has a minus one charge. The proton has a plus one charge. So let's take a look at an iron atom. An iron atom has two numbers associated with it. One is the atomic mass, which is the number of protons plus neutrons. This particular iron atom has an atomic mass of 56. The other number is the atomic number, which is 26 for iron. This is the number of protons, and it characterizes that particular atom. Anywhere you find iron, it will always have 26 protons. If you need to know the number of neutrons in a particular iron, you can take the atomic mass and subtract the atomic number. This will give you 30 neutrons for the iron. When you look at the periodic table, you will see that iron has a 26 associated with it, and also a number for the mass, 55.85. The 26, as discussed, is the number of protons. The 55.85 is the average mass of a mole of iron atoms. So as you saw in the previous slide, there are some iron atoms that have a mass of 56. But since the average is 55.85, there obviously must be some iron atoms out there that have lower than mass 56. In fact, if you look these up, you'll find out that there are four major isotopes of iron. 
each of these isotopes of iron has atomic number 26, but the atomic mass can range from 54 to 58. If we do the subtraction to determine the number of neutrons, you see that some iron atoms have 28 neutrons and others range up to 32 neutrons. And if you look at their isotopic distribution, most iron has 30 neutrons, but there's some that's a little lighter and others that are a little heavier. And the average of these atomic masses is what gives you that 55.85. So I just used a vocabulary word, isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element which have the same number of protons and electrons, but different numbers of neutrons. The very classic example students usually are given is chlorine. The two major isotopes of chlorine have masses of 35 and 37. Both types of chlorine have 17 protons, so if you take the difference between the atomic number and the atomic mass, you'll find out that 70% of the chlorines have 18 neutrons, and 30% of the chlorines out there have 20 neutrons. And if you take the weighted average of these masses, you wind up with close to 35.5, Bringing this out a few more decimals, the average mass of a mole of chlorine atoms is 35.453 grams per mole. Now let's look at the relationship between protons and electrons. Neutral atoms have no net charge, so their number of protons is equal to their number of electrons. A cation has a positive charge. This is because the number of protons exceed the number of electrons. You cannot change the protons of an atom in a chemical reaction. So the only way to get a cation is to remove the electrons from an atom. An anion has a negative charge, which means it has more electrons than protons. Since you can't change the number of protons, the way to make an anion is to add electrons to an atom. To get the charge on an atom, you can take the number of protons minus the number of electrons. And if you need to calculate the number of electrons, you can take the number of protons and subtract the charge. So let's look at a couple examples. I've chosen antimony because it is a metalloid and can form both a cation and an anion. Here are some different ions and isotopes of antimony, which has chemical symbol Sb. Let's start with neutral antimony. It has an atomic mass of 121, and if we go to the periodic table, we will see that it has 51 protons. Here you see antimony on this metalloid row right here, and it definitely has 51 protons. So if we want to find the number of neutrons in this antimony, we take the atomic mass of 121 and subtract the atomic number of 51. This particular antimony has 70 neutrons. The charge is neutral, so the number of protons will equal the number of electrons. Now let's try cation antimony of a higher atomic mass and a 5 plus charge. First off, still 51 protons. The neutrons, however, have gone up by 2 because now we have 123 minus 51. So this particular antimony has 72 neutrons, so it's an isotope. As far as the charge goes, remember that it, this is a cation. So that means we need more protons than electrons. So we're gonna take our protons and subtract our charge to have 46 electrons. It's a cation, so 51 protons compared to 46 electrons. Now let's try an anion. 
Once again, protons are 51. This isotope has 72 neutrons. The charge on this antimony is minus 3. So we have to have extra electrons, more electrons than protons. And sure enough, if we take the number of protons minus the charge, so this would be a minus a minus 3, we wind up with 54 electrons. So electrons are in greater number than protons, hence we have a negative charge and an anion. Here are just a few more examples before we start your problems. We want to know how many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in sulfur with atomic mass 35 and charge minus 2. Well, first off, we should find sulfur on the periodic table and see that it has 16 protons. How about the neutrons? Well, we have an atomic mass of 35. And if we take that and subtract the number of protons, we will wind up with 19 neutrons. What about the electrons? Well, remember, if we take the number of protons and subtract the charge of minus 2, a minus a minus is a plus, so we wind up with 18 electrons. That's how you would parse that question. Let's try another one. What species has 18 electrons, 24 protons, and 30 neutrons. Well, we need to go to the periodic table and find out who has 24 protons. And it's chromium. All right, chromium has an average atomic mass of 52, but let's see if this one in particular does. In order to get the atomic mass, what do we need to add? Protons and neutrons. So 24 plus 30 gives us the isotope that has an atomic mass of 54, not the average mass of 52. For the charge, remember that protons minus electrons, which we're given right here, give us our charge of chromium plus 6. So these are some good vocabulary terms for you to know. The proton is, of course, a subatomic particle with a charge of plus one and an atomic mass of one. Neutron, a subatomic particle with a charge of zero and an atomic mass of one. Electron, a subatomic particle with a charge of minus one and an atomic mass of close to zero. Atomic number, that would be your number of protons. Atomic mass, also called mass number, would be the number of protons and neutrons in an atom. Isotope, we've already defined. Atoms with the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. A cation is a species with more protons than electrons, which means it has a positive charge, and an anion is a species with more electrons than protons, so it has a negative charge. So here's one of your first questions. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons are in an oxygen atom with an atomic mass of 17 and a charge of minus 2? So I trust you will go somewhere to a periodic table and look up the number of protons. And I will give you one last set of reminders that the number of neutrons is going to be equal to the atomic mass minus the number of protons. And the number of electrons is going to be equal to the number of protons minus the charge. Here's another question. I trust you can follow the steps from the previous question. Here's sort of a backward question. We want to know the identity of a species with 11 neutrons, 10 electrons, and 12 protons. 
So don't forget that whatever our symbol is, protons go here, protons plus neutrons go here, and charge is protons minus electrons and goes there. So I hope that will help you find it. Here is a question that's going to take even a little bit more thought because you're not given the number of protons. So let's start with our symbol of our material. Remember that our charge is going to be equal to the number of protons minus electrons. So you do have the number of electrons and you do have the charge. So you can through these facts, figure out what the number of protons are. And from there, it should be fairly straightforward. 